So morning, everybody. Uh, and uh, thanks for being here early in the morning, as always. Morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, we're going to continue with the second to last of our series of lectures on recurrent neural networks. Uh, specifically, we'll continue with the topic that we were uh, discussing in the last class. But then just to remind you of what the topic really was, if my, oh my good God, if my uh, PowerPoint will only decide to respond. So what we were really talking about was sequence to sequence conversion. Now, does any of you remember what I meant by sequence to sequence conversion? I mentioned this in the last class, anyone? You guys remember? It's gotta be somebody, see someone even paying attention? Yes, no. A sequence of inputs producing some sequence of outputs. That was about it, right? So uh, you had, you have this process, sequence to sequence, and some A, B, C, D, some sequence of sequence goes in and out pops some other sequence. So this is a general process of sequence to sequence conversion. Now you could have some N symbols going in and a different number M coming up, where M could be lesser than N, it could be equal to N, or it could be greater than N. It doesn't, regardless, these are all instances of sequence to sequence conversion. Now specifically, uh, you have different forms. We have the uh, one that we, co we considered when we began speaking about recurrent neural networks was where the output and the input were aligned. So you had as many outputs as we had inputs. But the more generic case that we began speaking about in the last class where was where the output was order aligned, but not time aligned with the input. So the number of output symbols was different than the number of input symbols. So uh, you, could, you would have something like speech recognition, some signal goes in and uh, maybe hello world comes out. So now this is order aligned because you know that hello, which is the first output here, corresponds to the initial portion of the recording and, and world, which is the second word here, corresponds to the second, second portion of the recording. So this was order aligned. And this is the, this is the specific form of sequence to sequence conversion that we were speaking of. Now, you can also have uh, other kinds like machine translation, a word sequence goes in, a word sequence comes out. Di Again, there's some relation over here. The relation is immediate, but it's not sequential. Or you could have something like dialogues, a user statement goes in, a system response comes out. What goes in and what comes out are only connected at a very latent level. There, is, there doesn't have to be any immediate connection between the user statement and the system's response at all. Or question answering, same thing as dialogue, right? So what we've been looking at is speech recognition. Some signal goes in and a, a sequence of symbols comes out. There is an order correspondence between the two. You can also have something like this, machine translation. I eat an apple, Ishaba and an apfel gegessen. These two are related, but then the number of output symbols is different from the number of input symbols. And moreover, there is no order correspondence. For example, I over here, corresponds to ish, but then eight actually corresponds to habe and gegessen. So basically you have this one word which split into two words on the output side at two different ends of the sequence. And an apple you know, follows as ein and apple. So you can see that there is no clear order correspondence. In fact, there may be no order correspondence at all, but there is a correspondence of some kind. Now, this is not something we'll be looking at in this class. We're going to continue looking at this first, uh, uh, first uh, type of conversion. And in the next class, we will be looking at the second form. Anyway, continuing with this, we saw, we, uh, we uh, considered two different problems over here. The first was inference. The inference was that you had some input coming in and what your network produced, this was your recurrent network, 
was an output of probabilities corresponding to each input. And somehow from this output of probabilities, you had to come out with uh, a simple sequence which had length possibly shorter than this one. And this, and you had to come up with the most plausible same simple sequence given the input. And we saw one is one way of doing it where you just greedily picked up the most probable symbol at each time, concatenated them, and then compress them so that it became, you eliminated repetitions. And we saw that this is one way of doing it, but then this has problems. It doesn't really work for very many reasons. Uh, the, uh, but assuming that we have some handle on inference, we are going to revisit inference today, and we're going to spend some time on it. The bigger problem was that of training. So in training, you would be given instances of this kind, x1, x2, xn. And the, this is the input. This is the target output, which would be maybe S1, S2. And since this is nearly order aligned, but you didn't really have any time correspondences given, the first thing you had to do was to uh, somehow there, uh, infer, figure out the time correspondence. And what did we call this? Extend, expanded version of the input, which had a time correspondence with the, uh, uh, the expanded version of the compressed sequence, which had a time correspondence with the input. What did we call this? Anybody remember? Guys? Um, a time synchronous series. We, we also call it an alignment, correct? An alignment. Yes, so you are aligning the symbol sequence to this input which means you're going to do this by repeating some of the symbols, the appropriate, we don't know exactly how many yet, but you're doing this by repeating each of these symbols uh, until the expanded out sequence matched the input in length. This was the alignment. And this alignment could be reduced back to the original sequence by compression, by eliminating repetitions, right? And once we had an alignment of the sort, how did we perform training? How did we say we could do the training? Anyone remember? Suppose you had all of these inputs and it's going to produce a, a set of output probabilities at each time. Now you're given the complete sequence S1, S2, but if you also had the alignment, then what was the procedure for, for uh, computing the, uh, for, for uh, training? The first thing we had to do was to actually compute the divergence. What could we do? Do you remember? Find the most possible sequence. Yes, but then what did we do with that sequence? We ordered like the first and the last one. We actually computed a time-wise, now that you had an alignment, you had a target output at each time, correct? Yes. And so because you had a target output at each time, now you could compute the divergence. And what is the divergence going to be? Anybody remember this? What is that? The sum of uh, each time step, like the minus log of it. Log of probability assigned to the specific symbol. Let me just call this yt of the symbol, right? Of the aligned symbol. This was your divergence. And so that's because you're treating this alignment as the ground truth at this point. And then you can just compute this divergence and then you can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the vectors at each time. And then these things can be propagated into the network, right? And you could, you could train all of your parameters. So this we had figured out. What was the issue with that? We didn't really have the alignment. And so uh, we said, okay, what we can do is to learn a model somehow, initialize your model somehow, then given the unaligned compressed sequences, we can estimate the alignment 
for the compressed sequences and what was the algorithm we used to estimate the alignment? The Viterbi algorithm? The Viterbi algorithm. You do this for every single training instance and then use the alignment that you had estimated to update the models and keep repeating the process, right? And uh, uh, one last bit. So suppose I had my inputs, x1, x2, x3, over here. And this passed through my network. And I got, say, say my vocabulary was, let me just write some odd thing. Say A, B, C, D, right? And if my compressed sequence, if the, if the unaligned sequence was uh, just B, C, what, what did I do in order to, come to, to perform the Viterbi decoding once I got the input? So I had to align B, C to these guys, right? Yeah. But when I pass the input through the network, it's actually giving me a probability distribution over all of the symbols. So what was the next thing I did? To eliminate everything that is not BC. Is that what is it all we did? And order. Uh, so we so so we basically copied the B row over here, right? Mm -hmm. And me we copied the B row out. Then we copied the C row out, right? And so now we got this reduced table. In fact, if the input had been BCB, we would have had B twice, right? And then what did we do next? We had, we had yeah. B as our like starting point and then and then the last character as our like ending point in the Viterbi algorithm. And then we just found a path through this, right? And yeah. this was an alignment. So this is where we stood. And this we said should work. What was the problem with something of this kind? Just using this algorithm. Anybody remember? It may just found the local optima. It is prone to poor local optima. And so we said it's heavily dependent on initial alignment. And so uh, we said uh, uh, you really don't want to commit to an alignment during any pass. So what we want to do is to consider all possible alignments. If everybody's comfortable with the situation so far, raise your hands, then I will proceed. I want to see maybe 60 or 70 hands raised. Very good. So we seem to be on track. Now, this was suboptimal because we are committing to the single best alignment that we guessed from the, uh, from the input, right? This was the most likely alignment. And then once you got the most likely alignment, we treated this as some kind of ground truth. And the divergence was simply the sum negative of the sum over time of the log of the probability assigned to the aligned symbol at each time by the network. So the symbol on the best path at time t. So the probability assigned by the network at time t to the symbol on the best path at time t. This was the contribution of each time t to the divergence. You sum this over the entire input. And this was what we minimized, but this alignment could have been wrong, right? So, but now I can look at this differently. What is that? Uh, I can think of, so let's say I have my graph. This is, this is my table, but I'm going to represent this for now as a graph, okay? Just for, uh, because we effectively that's what we do when we are doing our literally. Right, yeah. So every path over here, what was the probability of a path? First, what was the probability we assigned to each of these edges? Remember? What was it, guys? One. That was all, that was all. And what about the nodes? The what product, all of the nodes leading up to it, with it. No, but the probability assigned to individual nodes, what was that? So let's say you had B, C, B. The, the output of the network. This is the probability assigned to B at time one, right? This was the probability assigned to C at time one. This was the probability assigned again to B at time one. That was the 
that so this would be b at time two c at time two b at time two we we just the probabilities of the nodes where the probabilities assigned to this symbol at this time by the network and what was the probability of an entire path through the net multiplicative could you repeat yourself please was it uh, multiplying i believe you you just be it says the product of the probabilities of the individual nodes on the path right so now look at what happened so there are many different paths through the network each of these has a probability every single one of them has a probability i'm just this is path number 1 this is path 2 path 3 right and every one of them has a probability suppose do these probabilities sum to 1 anyone what do these probabilities sum to no what will they sum to over here what do these probabilities sum to so every one of these paths is an one. alignment of this symbol sequence to the input right yes or no yes and this graph the 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 sum of the the the, the uh, set of all the paths through this graph represents every single way of aligning this symbol sequence to the input is it right so is the probability of that simple sequence so the total probability of all the paths is going to be just the probability of this simple sequence that's about it right now suppose i were to sum divide normalize each of these paths the uh, the probabilities of each of these paths by this by the sum now these normalized probabilities effectively end up representing a oh shit okay these normalized prob, uh, probabilities effectively end up representing a probability distribution over the paths p of path correct is this making sense to you guys yes so selecting a path from the graph is the same as drawing a path from this distribution right yes and selecting the most likely path is deterministically always choosing the most probable path that's what we're doing okay so i can now if i go back and now think of the set of all uh paths as uh all possible of ways of aligning the input to the uh, of the symbol sequence to the input selecting a path is like drawing from the distribution over the probabilities for the paths selecting the most likely a path is is the same as deterministically always drawing the most probable value from that distribution but now i can change things instead of selecting only the most likely alignment so so what was i doing over here i was there each path represents an alignment so i have a probability distribution over alignments of the symbol sequence to the input and i was choosing the most likely alignment but then instead of choosing only the most likely alignment i can actually take the average over all possible alignments which is to say uh earlier what i was doing was i had the i was computing the divergence between the actual output of the network and the most probable alignment right this is what i was doing instead i can say what what would the corresponding uh, process of uh, considering all possible alignments be it's going to be the probability of alignment times the divergence of y with the alignment so this is this 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 was what we were doing earlier which was committing yourself to the most probable alignment you could replace that with this term over here 
which is taking the average over all possible alignments. Is the distinction between the two uh, interpretable to you guys? Do you understand that? Uh, okay. So what we want to do is to take the expectation over the entire distribution of alignments. And the divergence for any specific alignment is simply the sum over the negative of the sum over all time of the log of the probability assigned to, of the symbol assigned to time t by that alignment as computed by the network. So what I mean by this one is that uh, uh, if, I, if I had different alignments, suppose I had my x1, xn, so x2, right? And suppose my symbol sequence was s1, s2, this take four. One possible alignment was S1, S2, S2, S2. So in this case, S2 is five versus a uppercase. I really need different symbols. Uppercase S2, right? So whereas, so this term here is going to be the probability assigned. Actually, let me use a different, uh, let me use proper examples. Suppose my symbol sequence is AB, right? X1, X2, X3, X4. So one possible alignment is A, B, B, B. For this, for this alignment, if I were to choose this alignment, then the divergence is going to be minus log of Y time one of A or zero of A minus log of Y time one of B minus log y of two of b minus log y of three of b, right? Because a is being a is at time one, b is at time two, a is at time zero, b is at time one, b is at time two, b is at time three. And my, my indices are getting mixed up. If I had a different alignment, this is say let's let's say I had a a b b, then at this time the second term is going to be minus log of y of one. Hey, so in other words, uh, the, uh, this term here is the symbol that is actually aligned to the time t, to the input at time t. And this over here is the probability computed for this symbol at time t by the network. And so this term here is the divergence for the specific alignment, which is represented by the sequence of symbols. I mean, it may get a little, uh, a uh, little, little abstract, it doesn't really matter. What we are doing is taking the expectation of this over all possible alignments. And so let me write it out. So this is the divergence. This is the expectation over all possible alignments of the divergence computed for the individual alignments. And so using the linearity of expectation, I can take the summation out and I can take the expectation in. So this divergence, the average divergence over all possible alignments is minus of the sum over time of the expected log, expectation of the log probability assigned uh, of the symbol uh, aligned to time t. Now, exactly what does this term mean? Let's go back to understand what this term means. Let's go back and look at this graph again. So, it's nice to go off from abstraction to something concrete. Um, Biksha, we have a question over here. Yeah. So, uh, so the student asks, will this be an average of the whole sequence or an average at each output? So this guy here, this first term is the average over the entire sequence because this is an expectation over all sequences. And the term inside is the divergence for the individual for, for the individual sequence. This, so this is the entire sequence within the square brackets. But what happened is because of the manner in which we wrote the divergence, the, di the uh, divergence for any sequence is the sum of the divergences at individual times. So as a result of that, the, the summation can go outside. And now this is the sum over all time of this expectation term computed at individual times. So both the statements that you made are correct. Does it make sense? Yes, no. I'm guessing yes. Raise your hands if it didn't. 
then uh, then uh, uh, I can go over that again. I'm going to just keep flowing forward, right? So, okay, so let us know in chat if it may if something breaks down. Okay, now let's consider this guy over here. What is this term? This term is the expected log probability of the symbol that is aligned to time t. So this term here may not make a lot of sense, but then let's look at the dot. In our, in, in our example, we have four symbols, B, E, F, and D. E. So there are four possible symbols. So what are the symbols? So let's consider the time four, right? What are the various probability symbols that can be aligned to time four? Anybody in this example? Y, B, the, the I, Y, F, I, Y. So these are the four, right? So what we are going to, this term over here is, is this, this expectation term is going to be an expectation over all four possibilities. Specifically, it's going to be the probability that B was in the alignment at time four times the log of the probability of B plus the probability that, which is this guy here, right? Pro plus the probability that E was in the alignment at time four times the log of the probability of E which is the node probability over here, plus the, the probability that F, the third F was in the alignment at time four times the log of the probability of F, plus the probability that E was aligned to time four times the log of the probability of E. So did that make sense to you guys? So this probability here is the probability that this symbol B was aligned to time four. And this term over here is the probability of the symbol B itself. So this is for alignments and this is for the symbol. This is what you're taking the expectation of. So you're summing over the entire column. Did this make sense to you guys? Because I'm gonna tee off of this. Yeah, the, the divergence here at the bottom with the double sums, that's an expansion of the ones above it. So this so this summation t is this guy here. The time is the time is iterating through the time. Yeah, and so this this inner summation is just this expectation inside the sum. Yeah. Okay. And right. at any given time, this expectation is the sum over the entire column represented by that time, and the sum and the sum of the product of the probability of aligning each symbol to that time times the prob log of the probability of the symbol itself. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Any, professor, yeah. Uh, what's the big Y, big Y notation here means? So the big Y. So here is here is what happens, right? Uh, I have my network, which takes one, right? It takes these inputs, and I'm drawing the entire network by this flat structure, and the network is producing a probability distribution at each time. So the network's output is y0. Okay, let me use the one, two, three. This is y1, y2, y3. So this y is the probability distribution output by the network at time t. Okay. Okay. Now this 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 probability distribution has some probability assigned to say the symbol b. Right? And some yeah. other probability assigned to a. So this guy, this term here is the probability assigned to the symbol ST at time T by the network. Okay. That's okay. what goes into these node probabilities, right? So these are, so it's the product of the log of the node probability times the probability of aligning this symbol to this time. And you're summing over all of the entire column. And so, that's basically what I'm saying here. The issue is this guy was already output by the network. This is not a big deal. You just did your forward inference. You got these probabilities from the network. What is this term? This is the term that we really need to compute, which is the probability that a symbol B was aligned say to time four, right? So how do we compute it? First, okay, there's a, there's a poll guys.
the first one was for the Viterb training, right? And let me show the poll to those who are watching. Okay, so stop the polling. Share the results. We'll uh, the answers. I won't give you the answers. The answers should be fairly obvious to you. If not, uh, for the for, for the first one, in the Viterb training, we did note that it's not enough to estimate the alignment of the training C sequences only once. The first two were correct. Uh, you compute the derivatives and then you propagate the derivatives back through the network to learn the network parameters. But then you have to iteratively keep re-updating the alignment. When you're averaging over all possible alignments, then because of the way we did it, you don't actually explicitly need to compute any alignment because you're averaging over all of them, right? Otherwise, the first two were right. So now let's consider this term here. This is the probability of aligning the symbol E to the time t, let's say, right? But what is this conditioning? This conditioning means that. When I'm saying I'm aligning the symbol e to the time t, it really is because I'm also considering given that the actual compressed symbol was beefy. So the input is given, this compressed sequence is given and saying, no, I know that this is beefy. What is the probability that the symbol at time three was e? That is this probability over here, which is what we were using in the uh, expectation here, but then, that is proportional to, to the term to the joint probability of obtaining the sequence and aligning e to the time three. three. So uh, is the distinction between these two clear to everybody? Sorry, can you repeat that? So this first guy here is, says, what is the probability that I'm going to be aligning, say, the symbol e to the time three, given that I'm trying to align beefy to the input, right? Because you could, this graph constrains the input to be beefy, right? This guy says, what is the probability that if I simply uh, uh, randomly drew something, symbol sequences from the output of the network, I would get beefy and E is going to be aligned to time three. So, this is assuming that you're working on the entire output of the network. This is assuming that you're constraining yourself to just the symbol sequence B phi. Okay, that's clear, thank you. Right, so the two are proportional. This is just Bayes rule. And so this means that what I really need to be able to compute is this guy, because if I divide it by P of S, which is the total probability of the graph, I'll end up with the first term, okay? And now I'm going to, uh, skip a few slides, but here. So, so, so actually let's consider this. What is this second term? This second term. This second term is the joint probability of obtaining this input sequence and aligning E to time three, right? What are all the ways in which I can produce the symbol sequence B phi and align E to time three? Can you tell me from just looking at this graph? What are all the ways of, of having the symbol sequence B phi and aligning E to time three? Y2 anyway. has to either be B or Just B. tell me from the figure. What is it? Two possible ways. It's all possible paths through this graph that yeah. go through E at time three, correct? So this probability here is the total probability of the, of the subgraph shown in blue. Is it making sense? Yes. Right, this is the subgraph that produces B phi and produces E at time three. The total probability of this subgraph is the probability of aligning E to time three and generating B phi. So if that's making sense, raise your hands. I'll wait for 60 hands to be raised. All right. 
very gratifying. Either you're lying or it makes sense. Okay. So, uh, Professor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, this uh, this probability is actually the term on the left, right? No, this this probability is the term on the right because I'm looking. Remember, the total probability of all of the paths through this graph is the total probability of S. It's not conditioned on S. Remember, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I did this. I moved to this term here so that I can just look at the total probability to the graph. I'm going to have to go from here back to this later. Okay. I had a question. I am yeah. not... You go first. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I am not very sure, like, how do we say that P is, like, the first term is proportional to the second term. This is just Bayes' rule. Okay. 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 And, like, in terms of, in terms of like conceptually, I I feel like I lag in there. Okay, I'm so conceptually, here's what is happening, right? So suppose I have my network output. If I were to randomly generate sequences from the network output, my training data is S1, S2, correct? But if I were to randomly generate sequences from the, from the network output, I so let's say my training data, training sequences A, B. my actual random sequence of generations could have anything including symbols that didn't have A and B in it, correct? Yes. Some subset of those are going to be compressible to AB. Right. So the probability of AB is going to be the total probability of the sum subset of all outputs of the network that is compressible to AB. Right. Okay. And the only ways, the only alignments that are compressible to AB are the paths through this gray graph, gray and blue graph, right? Yes. So the total pro pro probability of all paths through this graph is going to be the probability of S. Okay, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And here I'm specifically concerned with the, with the uh, outputs which match BFE and also have E at time three. That's this term here. Okay. Right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like we are uh, additionally put putting another constraint that at time three, we should have Y3. Yes. Okay. And Matthias, what was your question? Uh, yes. Um, so the left term is for beefy and the on, on on the formula and the right term is the, the probability that it's gonna be E at time three. Should there be a difference in, in symbols for the formula? So is it okay that they both have like the exact same? So they're the same thing here. What is the probability that if I, if I tell you, if, if I tell you that it's only going to be B phi and nothing else, what is the probability that the symbol at time three is gonna be E? Okay, that's what this guy is. So in this case, I'm restricting you to this graph. This guy is saying, what is the probability that I will produce BFE and at time three, it's going to be E. Oh. So, this, so the vertical bar moved right. Okay. Right? Makes sense? Uh, Professor, you. could you explain the intuition behind actually doing this as in why couldn't we work with the term on the left? Because we do want to work with the term on the left. But the term, the, but this graph doesn't directly have all the information required for this graph, because the paths over here are all the outputs of the network. So when you consider, when you sum up all of the probabilities of all of the paths through the network, you're actually going to get p of s. It won't be one. Whereas if you want to work with this guy, you want all of these probabilities to sum to one. Remember? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yes, Ive. Um, sorry, just to make sure my understanding is correct. So uh, for the term on the left, essentially, uh, by looking at this graph sets that it is the uh, total probability of all um, valid paths that um, has uh, the term e, uh, e at time three, right? Yeah, so, so this, so no. Regardless, so, regardless of whether the- uh, No, no the so hang on, hang on. That, so the, the term on the left, the term on the left has this denominator term over here, which is normalizing things. Okay. The term on the right doesn't have it. That's it. Okay. 
and the, okay yeah. okay so because and uh, you know if i want to be able to compute the term on the left i need to be able to compute the denominator too and it's not obvious how i'm going to sum over all possible paths to begin with right right so we're going to so we're just going to push it onto the left. so so we're going to use work, work with the term to the right so everybody comfortable with this raise your hands and the beauty of it is once you actually wait okay, continue raising your hands i want to see 60 hands right uh, but i'm not going to stop talking uh, actually i will Okay, 58, two more please. Somebody raise your hands. I like the number 60, okay, good. So what we really want to do is to compute the total probability of this blue subgraph. That gives me this term here, right? And it looks horrible because if I had to go through, if I had to explicitly enumerate all paths through this graph, there's gonna be a very large number of them. But then here's what happens. Uh, ignore all of the math on the slides. So this, blue subgraph actually has two two portions, which is, I should have flipped the colors. The blue subgraph is, let me get some empty portion of my thing. So I had this subgraph of this kind, something that went through this and then Right. Maybe you had this this subgraph, right? So, so this guy was in there. So if this was the subgraph, I can sort of decompose this as the head graph, I'll call this A, right? And the tail graph, I'll call this B. So this is A and B. And so the entire graph G which goes through this node, right? G is A and B. It has to go through A and it has to go through B. Is this making sense? Yes. Okay. So the probability of the graph, which is the graph that goes through this node at time T is going to be the probability of A times the probability of B given A. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Raise your hands, guys, if you're with me. 60 hands, because this is everything's just building off of this. Right, thank you. So this is very easy, right? So I need to be able to compute P of A and P of B given A. But then here is something else that happens. What is the probability of this graph? So suppose I have a symbol sequence A, B, C, C, D, okay? This, and let's let's say this is the time t, okay? And this is time greater than t. So this is the probability of aligning a, b to times one through t, correct? That's the red graph. Making sense? Yep. And the green graph is the probability of aligning, what is the probability of, what is the green graph? It's the probability of allowing C and D from T plus one to the end. It's actually B, C, D because B, you know, this line also continues, right? Yeah. So it's B, C, D to T plus one through end. Okay. And now here is the crazy thing. Because the input is already given, since I'm fixing the times, and since that means that the probability, if you, if you look at how the neural network actually computes outputs, I have the x1 through xn, and x1 and xn through xn are given, it's deterministic, right? Then I have my hidden layer, and then I'm computing the y's, right? These are the y's. So suppose this is time t. Suppose this is the time t, and I'm giving you the entire input, which means I'm giving you the entire hidden layer as well, right? Because the entire input is given then do the probabilities computed over here, are these probabilities influenced in any manner by the probabilities computed here? Yes or no? 
you have already given the whole sequence? I've given the sequence. Uh, then they are independent. Then they are independent because this is already given, right? Yeah. So what does this tell us about this? Come on, stop moving, stop moving. Okay. So what does that tell, that tell us about this term? What is P of B given it? Just probability of B. This is just probability of B because if the input is given, P of B given a X equals P of B given X because the hidden layer is already determined, right? That clear for everybody? Yes or no, raise your hands. Where's my mouse? My mouse disappeared. Thank you. So, all right. So, so what this means is that the probability of the graph here, unbelievable, my mouse is gone. So the probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B, right? So this is basically what we're the point of this. So that means the probability of the entire subgraph that goes through this node at time T is the probability of this graph times the probability of this graph. So, I can decompose it, my colors flipped, I'm sorry about that, I should fix it. So the probability of the entire subgraph that goes through this node at time t is the probability of the pink graph times the probability of the blue graph, which is what I've underlined by these two lines here. Making sense? Raise your hands, okay. I'm gonna have you guys raise your hands a few times. All right, and now, so this red graph is the entire subgraph starting from the top left node and arriving at time E at time three. So this is forward from the beginning to this point. So I will call this the forward probability and represent it as alpha TR, which means that it is the probability of the subgraph that aligns the R symbol to time T. This graph, is everything from the end backwards to that point, but not including that point, okay? And so not including that node. And I will call this the backward probability, beta TR, which is the probability of the subgraph starting from the alignment of the rth symbol to time t. So this notation clear to everyone? Yes, no, raise your hands again. Guys, this is good exercise for you. You've got to do it a few times. 49 hands raised, which means there's a whole bunch of you didn't get. Okay, so let me continue. So let's look at how we compute this first term. If I can compute each of these two terms, I'm done. That means I can compute the total probability of the graph that goes through this node. Let me see how I compute this alpha TR. You know what alpha TR is at this point. That is the probability of the subgraph that aligns the rth symbol to time t, right? But then this subgraph is very interesting. It's actually got, there are only two ways of arriving at this node. I can either arrive at this node from here or I can arrive at this node from here, right? So in other words, the subgraph, in order to have passed through the subgraph, starting from here and arriving over here, I should have either gone through the subgraph that came to this point, basically, basically the subgraph that ended up with at B at time two, and then transition to this one, or I should have gone through the subgraph that arrived at E at time two, and then transition forward to transition forward to this node. So is this decomposition making no sense to you guys? Yes, no. Yes. Okay, raise your hands. I will just wait for everybody to raise hands. This is. I'm going to do, I'm doing this whole thing without math. I'm just going to do this with figures and you're going to answer my questions, right? So suppose 
I call the There's something wrong with my whiteboard. Okay. So suppose I uh, call this term alpha e three e. Right. This is the probability of aligning e to time three. What is the probability of this subgraph? The first term. What is this first term? Anyone? So what is this first term? Someone reply. Be like 50% uh, for the first to go to Y1B and then one third to go to Y2B. There's no 50%, it's entirely this. What is the, so this is the probability of this guy is the probability of arriving at B at time two and then transitioning to E at time three, right? What is the probability of arriving of the subgraph that ends at B at time two? Product of all of the probabilities. Using, using the same notation that we've just used. Is That's it going to be alpha two B? Alpha two B, correct? And and then you're extending it. Sorry, sorry, this should be even. What happened to my well, this is here, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. What about the second term? That would be alpha to E um, times Y uh, E at time three. So did this make sense to everybody? Raise your hands. Um, could you please repeat it? I'm a little bit confused. Okay, so look at this. Uh, this graph, this is the probability of the subgraph that arrived at time three that aligned the symbol E to time three, right? Yes, no? Yeah. But there are only two ways of coming to this node, either through this first node or through the second node here, right? Right. So that means to have come here, align time E at time three to time three, then you must have either aligned B to time two and then move and then aligned E to time three, which is to say that, that you took a path through the subgraph that arrived at B at time two and then came here, or you aligned this E to time two and then aligned and, and then moved to this node, which is to say, you took a path through the subgraph that ended up at E at time two and then moved forward. So did that make sense? Yeah, I see. I'm just a little bit, I'm not sure about the notation Y, B, Y, three, what is me? So this was, this guy, this is an E, there's no B here, sorry. Oh, 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 oh I'm sorry. Okay. I can't find my <laughs> eraser. Okay, okay here's, my, here's my eraser, right? I got a. My, my 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 laptop is misbehaving, so. No worries, I got it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so so if this made sense to everybody, then we're good, right? So this literally means that here I have only two predecessors, but in general, in a more generic graph, I could have any number of predecessors. So the alpha at any time t for any any row r is going to be the sum over all the predecessors at time t minus one of the alpha for the predecessor node times ytsr. So is this equation making sense to you guys? Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay, straightforward, right? So what this, yeah, yeah. So Grant, was there a question? No, I guess you were just raising your hand, right? Uh, so any questions? No, okay. So what this means is that I can compute the alpha at time t in terms of the alphas at time t minus one. That's all we really needed to know. And specifically, that's your, that's your forward algorithm. And so for the specific case of this graph, every node has only two parents. 
it's the uh, same row at the previous time. So alpha TR is alpha T minus one R or the same, the previous row at the previous time plus alpha T minus one R minus one times the current symbol, the probability of the current symbol. So this is your forward recursion. And now let's actually write the entire algorithm out. Here's this actual forward algorithm. It's very trivial. At the very first time, you're only allow, allowed to align the first symbol. So the subgraph that are, uh, ends over here at time t has only one node, which is, and the probability is simply y0 as zero, in which case y0 b. And you are not allowed to align these guys to the first symbol for first time. So the probabilities for these nodes, the alphas for these nodes are going to be, is going to be zero. So is this making sense to you guys, the initialization? Yeah. Right. And then I can go forward. I have defined this for my first column. I go forward. For the first guy, there's only one parent. So I've just made a special case for it in my code. I didn't need to. Uh, so the probable alpha for this node is going to be the alpha for this node times y, yib. But the later ones, for each node, you're basically just summing up the alphas for the parents and then multiplying by the node probability. I've left these shade unshaded because uh, for these guys, because both parents have zero probability, these guys will just naturally have zero probability. You don't have to make a special case. If you just computed this for every node in this column, you're gonna get the right alphas. And then you can slide one step forward. And as you can slide through this graph, and then for each node, you sum up the alphas for the parents and then, and then multiply that by the probability of the current node. You can go do this going forward to the end. And eventually you're going to compute the alphas for every single node in the graph, right? What is the alpha for this node over here? What does it stand for? Anyone? The probability of the graph. It's the probability of the graph because the probability of all paths starting from here and ending over here. So in the process you got as a freebie, the total probability of that the network would produce beefy, right? And so you've got the alphas for every node in the graph. So I have pseudocode over here, I'll skip that. But what this means is that we figured out how to compute the, this term, the forward probability alpha TR. So let me replace that. Now we've got to figure out how to deal with the second term, which is the backward probability, and which is which I'll call beta TR. And we're gonna use the same trick. So can you see how I could do something of this kind? So what we did for the forward was that we computed the alphas for each time based on the alphas for the previous time, right? Now, the beta is the probability of the graph that follows this node. Can you see some way of decomposing that also in a similar manner, anyone? Could we uh, flip the arrows and then run the same algorithm backwards? That's actually a pretty good idea, except you're gonna end up with the, the, the you know what? That's a brilliant idea. In fact, that's in fact that's what people do. But I'm going to do something a little more straightforward. This is the graph that we're trying to look at, right? So the probability of this subgraph, which is starting from this node but not including this node, that is if you, there are this node has only two children, two successors. So the probability of the subgraph, which starts from this node and goes to the end, you can do one of two things. You can either go here and go from this green node to the end, or you can go to the red node and go to the red node to the end. So the probability of the subgraph that follows this guy is the probability of the subgraph from this green node to the end, plus the probability of the subgraph that starts from the red node and goes to the end. So is that making sense? Raise your hands. Yes, no. Yeah. What is here? A certain number of hands raised. Keep raising your hands, guys, because it means the rest of you are not paying attention. Okay, 60. 60% 60 of the classes works for me. How can I? This is beta 3 1, right? It's the probability of the subgraph that follows if you align the symbol E to time 3. What is this guy? Anyone? 
Someone want to take a guess? Let me simplify this. I can pull this node probability out. So also I can pull this node probability out. So in that case, the probability of these of this subgraph is the probability of, of uh, E at time four times the probability of the subgraph that follows this green node. What is this term here now? Alpha four one. It's going to be Y E four times beta four one, right? Yeah, beta four one. And what about this guy? Y E four times beta four two. It's not Y E here. The symbol was F. Oh, F, yeah. Y F four, right? So that's it. Okay. Yeah. And so basically the B dot T R is the, uh, you got is Y, you're going to be doing it in terms of the T, t plus one, Y T plus one S R, which is the symbol in the R through it, time T, t plus one times beta t plus one r. So it's the beta of the next node in the same row. Plus you go one down, it's this guy, y t plus one s r plus one, which is the r plus one symbol times beta t plus one r plus one. So, or more generally for any node, you can go through all of the successors of that node and you would, you'd be summing over all of the successors, the probability of the symbol at that successor node at time t plus one times the beta of that successor node at time t plus one. So did this make sense to you guys? Crazy hands. Uh, Professor Wiley, uh, what's the intuition behind using two variables alpha and beta? Why couldn't we just do it with one? I mean, uh, let's just treat it just the second graph B as, in, as, a, as a graph A and done the same thing. I mean, it's not, I'm just calling out. We, we need the two separate variables. We need something for the left hand side for the for the for the graph going into the node, and you need something for the uh, right hand side going for the graph going out of the node. That's all. Okay. okay. So it's just two. So I'm calling them all standard. This standard notation. So I'm assuming all of you got it, and so I can actually write that the beta at each time is being computed in terms of the beta at the next time, right? So let's start off. At the final column, you're only arrive, allowed to terminate out here. So the beta for this final node is going to be one. For the rest of them, it's going to be zero. Then I can take a step back. And then for each node, I'm going to be summing. So take any particular, this figure may not be very clear, but for each node, when I, so let's say I've computed everything at time t. I've got the betas for all of these times. So I'm going to take one step far backward at t minus one. And for each node, I'm going to go over all of the successors of that node. And I'm going to say beta t minus one r equals the probability of the symbol. So let me call these successors, right? The probability of the symbol here times whatever it is, times the beta t plus one of this node, uh, right? Plus the probability of the symbol here times the beta t plus one, r plus one. So here in this case, I only have two successes, but more generally any number of successes could, could be had. And so I can just compute that to compute the betas for all of this column take a step back, compute it for this column, take a step back, compute it for this column, work my way back. I have the betas for the entire graph. And so in this process, what I have done is that I have also managed to compute the probability for uh, this post, this subgraph, which is the beta TR, right? I plugged it in here. Now here's what happened. When you were computing this, performing the forward algorithm, you were computing this alpha TR, you computed it for every node in the graph. It wasn't just specifically for this guy. So the forward path of the forward algorithm just went left to right and computed this alpha TR column wise for every node in the graph. Then you did a backward pass starting from the end, then you computed this beta TR for every node in the graph. 
after the two are done, I can go to any specific node in the graph. I already have the alpha and the beta. I can multiply the two, and that's going to give me the total probability of all paths going through that node in the graph. Is that making sense? Yep. That's, yeah, okay. So that's alpha TR and beta TR. But what I really wanted was the posterior probability, right? So what I will do is I'm going to sum up the product of alphas and betas across the entire column and divide by the sum. And that's going to give me the posterior probability of aligning E to time three, given that this is my symbol sequence. Does that make sense? This guy here? Raise your hands if it did. So awfully slow as the class progresses. Keep raising your hands, I'm gonna watch, right? I'm slow. Okay, 50. And I'm going to represent the symbol as gamma TR. Gamma TR is the probability of aligning the R symbol to the T at time given the symbol sequence, compressed symbol sequence, okay? Pseudocode for it. And so now here is my divergence. What is the point of all of this? I was computing the expected uh, divergence across all alignments, right? So this is the negative of the sum over all times of the sum over all rows of gamma TR times the log of the probability assigned to uh, the, the, the uh, symbols at that time by the network. And now I can use this divergence to compute the, what was again, the point of computing the divergence like was this, you want, you had the network and the network was computing, it has its own parameters. It computed Y1, Y2, Yn and in order to compute the derivatives, perform back propagation, you needed the derivative of the divergence with respect to yt for every time t. Once you have that, you can actually do the back prop. So this was what we really wanted. What we've done so far is to compute the divergence. Now, for any given particular training sequence, this yt, so let's say your vocabulary is a, b, c, d, e, right? So how many entries will YT have? Anyone? This is your vocabulary. How many? Five. 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 So YT at time T is going to have probabilities for A, B, C, D, and E, right? But suppose your compressed sequence was just say A, B, A. This is the training sequence, right? So if I want to compute this derivative, how many entries that derivative is going to have five components also, right? If the compressed sequence is ABA, what is the derivative with respect to C? Zero. Zero, Zero never figured, right? You're never actually learning anything about, you know, what about D? Zero. Zero, and E is? Zero. Zero as well, right? And now, so I got this graph, right? And let's say this is my time t, okay? So over here at each of these points, I had gamma, this guy is going to be gamma uh, t1. This guy is going to be gamma t2, sorry, gamma t2. And this posterior probability here is gonna be gamma t3. Gamma t3, right? So do I need to, co to compute the derivative for any yt? Do I need to consider these other columns? Yes, no. Look at the formula again. To compute the derivative for any specific column, do I need to consider the other columns? No because you're summing over columns, right? This summing over time is basically summing over the, summing over individual, uh, you're just sort of going across time and within each time you're summing across the column. So if I want to, and only this column, the tth column here relates to yt. So I can 
so uh, to compute the derivatives for any specific time, I only need to consider the inner term for that particular time. Did I lose you guys? Yes, no? Could you go over that again? Okay. So what happened is my divergence is the summation over all time. So which means that I'm summing for, uh, let me write this explicitly, right? There's a minus. Then I'm going to be doing summation over all of these guys, right? I'll call them R, gamma, one R, log of, P of whatever, log of y, r at one, right? Then summation, so I've summed over the first time. Then I'm summing at the second time, gamma two r, log of y, r of two. And then I'm gonna be summing over the third column. I'm good. Remember, we're going over time. So this is for the first time instant. This is for the second time instant. For the, this is for the third time instant, gamma r. So this is gamma three r, log of y r of three and so on. So is this equation making sense? Yes. Okay. So now which of these are functions of y r of three? Just this one, right? Yeah, so the rest of them don't really matter. Okay, so I can sort of, actually there's a little bit of, there's a lot that's hidden over here, but uh, Let's continue. So I can just focus on this one column. And so I can sort of uh, ignore all the other T terms because they don't really figure. And now, so considering this, uh, let's, So we've sort of settled. There's a little bit of hokey pokey going on over here, but let, let's ignore that. So we've sort of settled that the portion of the divergence that if I'm interested in the computing the derivative uh, of, oh, come on. So if, I, if I'm interested in computing the derivative of the divergence with respect to y3, then I only need to consider this third column. This is this is something that we have sort of decided, right? And so this I can just write as uh, minus God, the the divergence itself is minus gamma three so three e times log of y uh, what is this three e minus gamma three b which is this term, right? Log of y a3 minus gamma, and let me call this 3a2, which is the second instance of a, which is for this node, right? Log of y a3. The node probabilities are the same, but the gamma, the, the posteriors will change. So did this, are you seeing this, this equation? Is this making sense to you guys? Uh, shouldn't the second question be y, uh, y b3? Which one? Oh yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. So is this making sense? Yes. Okay. So now, if I want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to y t b, I only need to consider this one term, right? Because there's only one term, which is this node. Whereas if I want to compute the derivative with respect to y t a, I need to consider these two guys because A repeated, right? Y three A is occurring both here and here. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So it looks a little complicated, but then I'll actually show it on the figures. What you're really doing is the derivative, firstly, the derivatives with respect to the symbols that don't occur over here, they're zero. We don't need to care. For the symbols that do occur over here, to compute this derivative, you go over all of the rows where that symbol was replicated. So all the rows for which you have that symbol, and then you're gonna take the derivative of gamma times 
log right here, okay? And so here, for example, you'd be summing over, for E, you'd be summing over these two guys, right? And so now the question is, what is this term? And this term, the derivative of gamma log is gamma divided by log y is gamma divided by y. But you also have to worry about the derivative of gamma itself, gamma with respect, with respect to y times log y t. And I kind of lied when you said that, I, when I said that you can ignore the gammas at other times, it turns, it turns out that the gammas at other times are also dependent on this y. So it's actually a lot more complicated than this. There will be this extra term, which has to account for the gammas at other times, okay? And so this becomes tedious, but then there's a shortcut. You can do something trivial. You can just ignore all of these derivatives and just focus on the first guy. And if you focus on the first guy, then there's, there's a, then people like to explain this in, uh, in the original paper. They said that this is actually a maximum likelihood estimate as opposed to uh, a standard uh, discriminative uh, classification uh, 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 loss. So anyway, be that as it may, now the derivative that we have over here, which is these terms. Now, all you really need to do is to sum over all of the rows for in which that in the particular that particular symbol happened at that time. And since this one over y is a constant, it's just minus one over y of the sum of the gammas for all of the rows where, since where that symbol occurred. So did this make sense to you guys? Uh, can I get a question about previous equation? Because I'm not sure what, why could we ignore the second part? Yes, we, it... we, we, you can, well, in principle, you shouldn't. In practice, ignoring it is really hard, right? Why? Because gamma at every time, I mean, in practice, computing it is really hard because the gamma at every time depends on the y at every time, right? Yeah. You can't even focus on just that one t. So this becomes really complicated. So you, at this point, uh, the uh, instead of computer uh, trying to maximize the posterior probability, it turns out that if you just maximize the log probability, you can sort of ignore the second term. And I won't get into why, but it's it's that that's how the uh, you can actually look at the original paper on the topic, and they hand wave their way past it. Empirically, it works. That's about it. Okay. Okay. So uh, you. And so you end up with this particular formula, okay? You ignored a whole bunch of terms, but it turns out it's okay. So is this making sense to you guys? Raise your hands. Okay, so I'll stop him. So wait, I'm gonna spare, I'm going to continue with this for another four minutes. And then I'll take a pause, I'm way behind. I'll complete the rest of the lecture after giving you guys a break, okay? So here is the entire uh, procedure for training the sequence to sequence uh, models when you're given order aligned but not time aligned outputs. So you want to train the models. The first thing you will do is you're gonna set up your network. Your neural network is typically in a many layered LSTM. You can have the LSTM stacked on top of convolutional networks if you want. You initialize all the parameters in the network. Then you pass for each training instance, you pass the training instance through the, through the network. It's going to give you this vector of probabilities at each time. Then from the vector of probabilities at each time, you're going to select, you're going to create this, this reduce table which corresponds to the compressed sequence for that training instance. And then from this, you'd construct the graph. Then on the graph, you would first go left to right and compute your alpha terms for every node, then go from right to left and compute the beta terms for every node. And from those, you compute the gamma terms for every node. And then from the gamma terms, you compute the derivatives for every symbol, uh, at every time. So you basically compute the, you get the, the gradient for the output of the network at each time. 
And once you compute the gradient for the output at, at each time, you can back back propagate that gradient. And the rest of it below that, in the, below the output layer is just your standard backdrop. So uh, that's the story so far. So these were CTC models, sequence to sequence models, which uh, irregularly output symbols can be decoded by Viterbi decoding. Uh, they require alignment of the output of, to the symbol sequence for training, and this alignment is generally not given. So training can be performed by iteratively estimating the alignment by Viterbi decoding and time synchronous training, or you can perform, the, you can optimize the, do this by optimizing the expected error over all possible alignments. So Rashmi, can we have the second poll? Yeah, sorry, I did not want to interrupt you like 10 slides back, so we can have it now. Yeah. So. Let's see. Also, students said that the last poll was a bit, uh, like, tad bit longer, so could they couldn't like respond to it. That's okay. Well, we can we can post the poll on Piazza. All right, thank you, kids. So let's stop this poll. I think then both of these are true, right? Uh, so, all right. I'll. Uh, can we pause the recording here? Yep. Let's pause it.